Bizarre Brain Comics. Hello, my comic book friends, and welcome to Bizarre Brain Comics. Hmm. I am Gary, your host. Let me straighten this leg out a little bit here. There. I said, I am Gary, your host. This is where I like to take a look at some older comics, talk a little bit about the characters and creators, and examine the stories and the art. This time, we're going to go back to 1975. This is an Atlas title from Atlas Seaboard, 1975. And the, uh, I featured a few of these before. Atlas titles before. Remember, in the uh, in the seventies, there well, Atlas sprung up, but not out of just out of nowhere. This was uh, what was his name? Mark Goodman, I think was his name. The previous owner of Marvel Comics, he had sold sold Marvel. And uh, his son was to be kept on in an executive position there. And then when uh, the time came, he was uh, supposed to take on the title of of publisher, I believe it was what it was, for... Marvel Comics, which was, I guess, stipulated in the sales contract. But when that time came, they made Stan Lee the publisher instead of uh, the, the Goodman Jr. So Daddy Goodman invested his money and started a whole new comic company to compete specifically with Marvel Comics with his son as the publisher and they poached a lot of talent from both Marvel and DC primarily Marvel modeled their their look and presentation after Marvel taking the name Atlas which was the name of the of the company just prior to being changed to Marvel in, in uh, sixty that was what sixty one I think it was and uh, this isn't doing any good I'm stuffing up anyway and uh, they had a host of titles uh, from what I understand none of which ran for more than four issues, most of them less. But they did have a big impact in the in the industry because they poached people by paying higher, higher page rates and uh, royalties and the like, which forced ultimately forced Marvel and DC to do to do the same thing. So it became a net benefit for the creators. Even though the publishing company folded after only a few months. And the, uh, the editor-in-chief of Atlas Seaboard was Stan Lee's own brother, Larry Lieber, who afterwards uh, went back to Marvel. Even though Marvel said, you go to Atlas, you guys could never come back. Well, they they took them back. So, yeah, that's just a little bit of the backstory on that. Now, Phoenix was a superhero title here. Uh, ran for a total of four issues. This is number three. 
in the, uh, the the fourth issue, his costume changed. And that, and I don't know what else they may have changed, you know, because a lot of these characters changed a lot in just a few issues. Okay, but as I said, this is nineteen. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Phoenix. Number three, 1975, Atlas, written by Gabe Levy and uh, drawn by Sal Amendoza, Amendola, excuse me. And uh, the cover here is by the great Frank Thorne. And, this is, and I like this cover. I especially like his version of the Yeti. I, it's much better than the way the Yetis appeared inside the book. Uh-oh, I'm going to sneeze. Hang on. Uh, yeah. Whew. I managed to catch it just in time. Okay. Now, uh, Frank Thorne, who, who did this cover, <clears throat> he is best known for his interpretation of of uh, Red Sonia. That's when he, he really came to prominence, even though he had, what, 25 years under his belt before then. In comics, but he and he's so well known for he would well would have been called earlier a good girl artist. Did the very lovely and sexy women, and he, he his whole career was largely based around that after uh, after Red Sonia, creating his own characters, uh, doing stuff for men's magazines and the like even creating his own uh, own fantasy heroine uh, somewhat modeled after Red Sonia and uh, the interior art is as I said uh, Sal Amendola uh, he is a fine fine artist but I I don't like his work in, in this, uh, at least not for superheroes. I've seen some of his stuff before in other, other where, elsewhere <laughs> and I think his stuff is f is great for science fiction or fantasy, but I don't think it works so well for the superhero genre. And that's just to say I don't like his work in this context. He had some really nice work, though. Uh, and Mandola, he was Italian-born, 1948, but lived in America. He was an artist and teacher, primarily associated with DC Comics. He graduated from the School of Visual Arts in 1969 and started his career in 69 drawing for The Witching Hour at DC. And he became uh, Nick Giordano's assistant editor in 1970. And he worked in the production, uh, primarily doing coloring, inking, and lettering. And he did some work on uh, uh, Green Arrow. This is penciling work. Uh, and inking. Uh, Green Arrow. And uh, uh, on John Carter of Mars in uh, Weird, Weird Worlds. Then he went to Marvel for a while in '72. Then back to DC. He didn't. He didn't like Marvel. He did and he did some Batman stuff over several years. <clears throat> Eventually, he was an editor and a talent coordinator at DC until '86. For a time in the '70s, he worked at Archie and did some uh, storyboard work for movies. And he taught at the Joe Kubert School. He, later, he got his. Uh, uh, MFA uh, Master of Fine Arts I don't know when it didn't say just when he did that but he did go back later uh, at some later point and got his MFA so I want to do this a little more briefly Phoenix, I like this guy. Uh, the uh, and I really like the uh, Frank Thorne's version of the Yeti here. But we look inside the page, 
and the Yetis are attacking this village in Tibet. And you can see what I mean here. I, uh, I just don't like this version of the Yetis. Otherwise, the artwork is fine. Now, I do really like this panel here with uh, our, our guy Phoenix. The Texas Star. So, uh, this is issue three. Uh, from what I understand, they, they, they didn't rehash his origin. But in context, he I, I see that he was a, an astronaut. Something happened in space. He, he got this cool suit. Uh, got some superpowers and defeated an alien invasion. As the newspaper here says, Phoenix Downs, New York City Saucers. So he saved the earth. Here's, uh, and he's in Texas. He's not sure what he should be doing now. But he stops to eat. Uh, this cop asks for his autograph. And in the paper, he sees something about this Yeti attack. You know, what the heck? So he decides, well, I think I'll go check that out. So he flies to Tibet. This is really nice work on the face here. And his panel to panel, continuity, visual storytelling, all that is, is for the most part, very good. It's just his stylization I don't like for superheroes. But that's just me. Just my taste. So he gets there. He sees bodies laying around. All the all the people had been taken. But here is this one old man. There, and he's he comes stumbling out. He's injured, and, and says they attacked. They took everybody. They didn't take me. They, I mean, they killed a lot of people. The those who resisted too much, and they they took the others. They didn't take me because I wasn't strong enough for to be enslaved so he t uh, Phoenix takes him in into the weather because he is injured takes him into uh, one of the buildings he uses his own powers to heat up the room to make it comfortable and warm the old man talks with him and then we have a couple of pieces of ads and while they're talking in crashes three of the yetis and they take Phoenix by surprise and slug him, but it's not too bad. They uh, try to crush him. He fights back, uh, killing one of them. Uh, his uh, first response of, uh, of placing the old man in a force protective force field uh, protects the old man and knocks out one of the Yetis. He kills one here, apparently kills him. Could just be knocking him out, I don't know. And then takes out the third Yeti. Then uh, he thought they said uh, uh, the old man says that, that it's the devil. The devil is in charge. The devil sent the the yetis to attack them and he says he knows where the devil is so he says, okay take he de tries to get the old man to stay but okay puts him in a force field a little like uh green lantern or something i guess and then he they go to uh, uh where he thinks that the devil will be something uh, some c kind of light thing attacks him and he discharges that. Then, floating in the air is, quite literally, the devil. And he takes uh, the uh, takes Phoenix to his command center in a cave. And more ads. Every two pages, there's an ad. Two pages of ads. And it is very sophisticated, like a laboratory setting. And it turns out that the villagers that he's using, that he captured, are being transformed into the Yetis. He's building a Yeti army to take over the, the planet. Now, he's got certain sensors and stuff in his suit. 
Plus, he kind of recognizes the technology. This, these, he is one of the aliens that had attacked Earth. He, who had been, in, he tells his backstory. Uh, he's, they capture him, chain him up. He gives his backstory. He was imprisoned here ages ago, uh, and and uh, basically freed when the uh, he def Phoenix defeated the other aliens. Now he's on his own quest. Uh, now he's got a, a mutated monster here. He's who supposed to destroy Phoenix. Well, it doesn't doesn't quite work that way. Uh, the old man who, who was sneaking around at. Uh, Starts smashing panels, distracting the, uh, the devil. He claims that he is the devil, but he's an alien devil. And meanwhile, Fe Phoenix manages to get freed, and the monster attacks and gobbles up the devil. Uh, and in the process, the cavern that they are in collapse it starts collapsing you get all the people out but the old man has died as a result and he tells him he's he is the hero it is because of him that you are freed but he was just an old shepherd yeah it doesn't matter and then off he goes and here we have an ad for two other atlas titles tiger man and the brute and oh john target man stalker uh I, I, I kind of like those as well. Then there's the backup story, the Rat Pack, the Dark Avenger. This was drawn by, see, it was written by John Albano and drawn by Pat Broderick. So I think this is the the earliest that I could think of, anyway, uh, art I've seen by Pat Broderick, who later did uh, a lot of Starman, one version of Starman, for DC, as and as well as I think uh, Captain uh, Captain Adam. Uh, this guy is just a local little uh, uh, crime fighter of sorts. I'm not going to go into the story, and I th this is, I don't know if he made another appearance in the issue four or not. But it's it's not. Really worth it. But it has some really nice artwork by Pat Broderick. Uh, I got to meet Pat Broderick very briefly just a few years ago at a convention before the pandemic. And he was publishing his old book uh, inspired by Zachariah Sitchin's uh, work uh, with the 12th Planet, Nibiru, and the like. And I'm getting so stuffy I can't, I can barely speak. That's really nice right there. <laughs> And so that's all I'm going to do with the Phoenix. And I hope you enjoyed that in spite of my stuffed up nose. And I don't know why I'm getting this, uh, getting all stuffy in my sinuses, even though I'm taking precautions against it right now. Uh, the, I, I, I like the Atlas. I, I want to, I like to get more of the Atlas books just because I at the I remember them. I got a few at the time and I've picked them up since then. Just because they're out of the norm. And uh the that story it was definitely unique, uh different, uh but also a lot der derived. They changed the the creators so much you couldn't get a fix on these on the characters and uh, but I enjoy reading them <clears throat> they're fun they're fun to read and uh, as as a lark so that's it please like share subscribe leave a comment do you remember these Atlas comics if you're old enough or do you come across them every once in a while what do you think of the Atlas comics in, and Phoenix in particular and uh, uh, let me know How do you, what do you think of that artwork like I said I prefer the Frank Thorne art here on the cover let me know what you think in the comments below Thank you for joining me. And remember, comics 
our art.